Good evening, uh, people. And uh, nice to see that people are filing in already. As always with our webinars, we are IT masters and we have a webinar tonight, how our AI can and can't improve cybersecurity, a report from the field. And uh, I see that we've actually said a report from the field twice, but we might fix that in the meantime. Anyway, um, just for the next three or four minutes, we'll let everybody get into the webinar session and then we will start and I'll do a proper introduction. Uh, my name's Shane, I'm from IT Masters and we're hosting tonight. So I'll speak to you in just a couple of minutes. Don't go anywhere. In the meantime, by the way, feel free to introduce yourself on the chat. Make sure your chat is set to everyone on the uh, on the system. Hello, DB. Let us know maybe where you're uh, dialing in from and what you know. if you've got any questions that you want to have, we will talk more about it later, but you can put the questions in the Q&A and uh, we're interested in some other things. So uh, yes, we shall speak soon. waiting for everybody to get on board. A couple of minutes can seem like a long time. So I'd like to welcome everyone again to our IT Masters and CompTIA webinar tonight. We are very uh, lucky to have a special guest speaker. And I would like to begin by um, paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land from which I am broadcasting, which is Wurundjeri country down here in Melbourne or Nam, as it's called and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, tonight, as I said, we, our webinar is how AI can and can't improve cybersecurity, a report from the field. So it's based on what's actually happening out there in the real world. Uh, we, a few housekeeping things before we begin. Uh, remember to set your text on chat to everyone. And if you have a question that you would like our guest to answer, please put the question in the Q&A section and we will ask when we get a break in the proceedings. Uh, we will usually ask a couple of questions while the uh, presentation's going and more at the end. Um, keep it nice on the chat as everybody always does. Uh, we're always really happy with our chats. Everybody usually participates beautifully and has uh, good things to contribute as well because by no means are we always the experts. Um, often there are people who we're uh, presenting to who have a lot more to sell us and inform us about what's going on. Anyway, enough of me blathering on. My name's Shane. I'm from IT Masters. And I would like to introduce our special guest speaker tonight. It's Dr. James Stanger from CompTIA. He is the CompTIA Global Evangelist. Is that the right title, James? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the chief technology evangelist. But yeah, it is global. I uh, uh, greetings from uh, Canberra. I live in Seattle, Washington, but I uh, I go all over. I'll be in Thailand next week and then I'll be in uh, the Netherlands and uh, Warsaw, Poland the week after that. Fantastic. Your uh, your partner must love that. <laughs> she she's coming with me to to Warsaw, Italy and Poland, but uh, it drives her crazy that I'm away so much. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. I bet indeed. In fact, I heard that somebody else is oh, that's right. And um, we've primarily everybody's from Australia here tonight because we basically only uh, released this to Australian uh, people. So uh, we only promoted it locally for a change. Um, so you're speaking to a, a very much a local audience, and James is here to speak at the CyberCon conference, I think it is, right. in uh, in Canberra at the moment, and has been doing some sessions there. You may well have caught him during the week. But anyway, I will get out of your way and let you go for it, James. Tell us about AI and cyber. Well, it's time to talk uh, about AI and cyber indeed. Shane, thank you so much. Thank you, Kit, for inviting me. And welcome, everybody. Uh, it's fantastic to be here. Um, AI, I've always kind of, uh, it's easy for us to kind of get caught up in what AI means because it, it's so subjective. I decided to put this picture here of, it's called the Giant's Causeway. And that those aren't man-made rocks. They look like it, but those are basaltic columns. That's the term. Uh, basalt actually can melt that way. Uh, and the idea is that these are steps that came out of the the the, uh, the sea, and the giants came and uh, populated Ireland in, in an old myth. Because um, I think there's a lot of myths around artificial intelligence. There's a lot of good stuff too, and I hope we can talk about some of those things. So thank you again, uh, Shane, for having me here. Uh, but uh, so I've been to the Giants Causeway. Uh, if you've ever seen, uh, let's see, Led Zeppelin's 
fifth album called Houses of the Holy. That's where they took that picture on the album cover. But here is another uh, height here, uh, Mount Ainsley uh, in Canberra. So I see from the chats, I see people uh, joining in uh, from Canberra. So here we go. I, I was able to climb that on uh, Sunday afternoon after visiting the National Memorial. It was uh, a touching thing to uh, visit that memorial. It was amazing. It's always amazing here to be in Australia. I've never been here until last November, where I was able to visit Melbourne. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to see you, Shane or Kit. So my name is James. And uh, Shane, thanks for uh, 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 saying my name correctly. Most people say it either Stanger or Stranger or Strangler, some sort of horrible name. But over the years, I've worked as a company president. I've worked as a security analyst, uh, as a uh, pen tester, as a firewall um, programmer, all sorts of things. So I've been a technical person. Hey, Hakan, how you doing from London? I'll be in London here in May. So maybe I'll see you there. Uh, so I've done a lot of work as a technologist and I'm lucky enough to talk to technologists around the world. Both technologists who have their fingers at the keyboard or are using the mouse to make AI or to create cybersecurity solutions. I'm also lucky enough to talk to people. Um, how should I put this? I'm lucky to have talked to people who hire people who use AI and, and, and are responsible for really cool solutions. So I'm going to give you a report from the field. So it's not just necessarily James's opinion. I'm going to be quoting a lot of people that I've met. Um, if you want, you can join me on LinkedIn. You don't have to. There's a link. If you want, you can open up the webinar chat and you can click on that link. That's my LinkedIn page. You can join in. Happy to, to, uh, to do that. If you don't have to, if you don't want to. Well, let's talk about First, I want to mention kind of an overview of cyber careers and what they look like today and give you a resource real quick. Next, we're going to talk about uh, kind of what AI is happening right now, because I work for the research department as the chief technology evangelist. And I'm here to talk to you about what we've found. We've polled about 500 uh, IT leaders, I, uh, company leaders uh, who are technical and they told us how they're using AI. And I'm going to talk about what AI can do for us and what it can't do for us in terms of in terms of cybersecurity. So first, let's drill down into what I call the four pillars of AI. And these, believe it or not, are not pillars. Those are uh, petrified trees from uh, Yellowstone. I was able to hike up to those. Uh, it was a fun trail. It's kind of an undocumented trail. Not a lot of people know about it. But they kind of look like pillars, don't they? But here are the pillars that I want to talk about real quick. Infrastructure, development, security, and data. You can even call that information if you want. But I call these the four pillars. Uh, I didn't come up with this. A friend of mine at work at CompTIA named Seth Robinson came up with this. The idea is that if you think of tech, you could roughly bring it into those four pillars, right? Infrastructure, meaning data centers, servers, the workstation you're using right now to view this webinar, right? Your mobile phone, that's infrastructure, got it? the automation, the databases we use, development, the code, right, that we use to tie all the infrastructure together, security, cybersecurity, and then the last one being data, right? And that's such an important thing. Does AI represent a fifth pillar, right? I, I would say fifth column, but that has uh, implications, doesn't it? Uh, does it represent a fifth pillar or will AI simply, or not so simply, work its way into infrastructure development, security, uh, and data? It already has, is one of my first answers. So AI, I'm not sure is ne necessary forever to talk about a separate pillar, but it's something that we have been using and benefiting from for a long time. For example, I think all of us have heard of spam filters, right? Maybe some of you have worked on a spam filter. If you have, uh, type it into the chat window. Oh, hey, Agaba, how you doing from Uganda? I've only been to South Africa, never been to Uganda, so maybe I can get over there. Um, I'm curious if any of you have ever worked on a spam filter. Okay, Mimecast, Nikki. Okay, great. Spam filters, I, just to let the cat out of the bag, do you realize that spam filters have been using artificial intelligence ever since they were created? And, and I mean that in a very real way. They use an algorithm, and I'll be talking about it in a few minutes, called the Naive Bayes algorithm. The Bayes algorithm, it's named after a guy named, his last name was Bayes, B-A-Y-E-S. He was a Englishman lived in the, what was he, a Methodist minister or philosopher back in the 17th century. That's an algorithm that we use a lot, in fact. So I know we're all you know, really new to uh, Gemini, it used to be known as Bard, we're, we're new to ChatGPT and all that, but we've been using AI for a long time. 
but there are new and exciting ways, of course, that we're using AI. When it comes to cybersecurity careers, check this out. I just want you to see this because you're viewing about 90% of the careers that exist right now. And I realize not all of these are cybersecurity jobs, but they, they are certainly adjacent. They're relevant to it. But look at this, cyber, uh, security analyst, right? The blue teamers, right? The pen testers, you can see pen tester in there. That's the red team. So you got all these jobs here. And I just want to point out as we drill down into there, that's right, Troy, Bayesian probability. And thanks, Kit. Everybody just pop into the Q&A window and then uh, Kit and Shane will make sure to, to do that. Here are some people that I met with just yesterday who were learning about cybersecurity. And we had some good discussions about the use of AI. And I'll be showing you a couple of things that we worked out near the end of the webinar. But if you're curious about how AI is impacting cybersecurity careers right now, I recommend you check out the AU Cyber Explorer. It's a website that we helped create at CompTIA. Ost Cyber created it. What's really neat about it is you can check out in real time, the types of the cybersecurity job roles that are happening right now. This is not just cybersecurity job roles uh, that were thought of years ago or months ago. It's happening right now. Another way to look at cybersecurity job roles, you can go up to comptias.org's uh, website. And we've worked with a company called, uh, sorry, not a company, with the U.S. government. Um, uh, it's called NICE, the NICE Initiative, it used to be called. NICE, and we uh, they basically captured all of the jobs that are found in the U.S. federal government. Now, I realize we're in Australia, but cybersecurity job roles worldwide have very a lot of commonalities. Is my point. So the reason why I brought all of that up about all the cybersecurity jobs and throwing out uh, off cyber and all these things is because I want to talk to you about how AI is and isn't affecting cybersecurity and ways that we can make sure AI affects cybersecurity in a positive way. So first of all, I think it's really important to understand that AI is pretty new to organizations as a general rule. Again, there are some areas in cybersecurity, for example, spam filters, been using them for decades. In other cases, though, most companies are still grasping and grappling with what AI really means. That's one of the lessons, one of the things I want you to take from this particular slide. So 69% of companies are using features of, AI, of business applications that have AI in it. And that could be something as trivial, frankly, as a link to ChatGPT that's in an application that says, hey, try putting this into ChatGPT and refine your spreadsheet or something, right? 37% of companies believe AI is really revolutionary. It's the number two priority for fundamental, uh, number two priority to teach people how to use AI better. What's the number one priority? Automation, which I find interesting because as you'll see in a slide or two away from here, I would agree, argue that artificial intelligence is a form of automation. Automation, I would say, is the larger circle, right? And within that large circle would be lots of smaller circles. And AI would be a very significant one of those circles within a automation. Because in my opinion, automation, excuse me, in my opinion, AI is automation that can learn by itself. Okay, kind of like a toddler. Oh boy, can they learn by themselves and are they automatic? General viewpoints about AI, folks. Some people are saying, hey, it's a revolutionary new tool. It's about 40%, right? Um, oh, that CompTIA Aussie cyber site. I'll go back to there real quick. You can check it out. You can use your phone. It's called Aussie Cyber Explorer. Uh, so there it is. Take a take a real quick, quick shot of that, Darren. Uh, I'll give you another second. Ooh. We'll get there a link and put it into the chat in a couple of minutes. I should okay. just, I was going to interrupt there as well. And yeah, um, go ahead, man. Remind people who are our uh, students in our in our courses with a student number um, that we actually have an arrangement with CompTIA that they can get a discount. But we will also be doing a short course in a couple of months on Security Plus and explaining that for people hey. as a free short course. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Well, Here's the thing that I thought was interesting. We asked about 500. By the way, this survey is of about 500 people worldwide. And these people aren't, these are people who are leaders in their companies, okay? Uh, CIOs, CISOs, things like that. And we asked them, what are the big time skills breakdowns? And notice it kind of goes into this, those four pillars, data, cybersecurity, software, infrastructure. And notice where it talks about understanding of vulnerabilities under cybersecurity. And notice where it talks about 34% under improving cybersecurity. So it's interesting there's interest and that understanding vulnerabilities, I'll say it really quick. 
Cybersecurity Threat Intelligence, CTI. In other words, there's there are all sorts of feeds that, that leaders can get, that people can get. Uh, the CVE, the Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures Databases, right? It's overwhelming, okay? And all of this information, software bills of materials, SBOMs, that's what they're called, SBOM, software bill of materials. All of this information is really overwhelming. And the hope is that you can use automation or AI to sift through all of that data. And then you could go, oh, instead of me having to spend hours on something to read through that data, AI can sift through automatically and find that information. So this is where AI skills are hoped to be. But what we find is that people are really interested, leaders are really interested in making sure AI is taught everywhere, right? 33%, the majority wants to do that. And Troy, yeah, automagically, I use that word a lot, I have to say. And I usually use it in kind of a negative way. I, I think it's, you know, IT requires work. And if we can get automation going, that's great. But uh, I like to think, I, I don't think in terms of magic, right? So the idea, folks, is that we need people to learn about AI across the board. Uh, in cybersecurity is great. But notice some people are saying it's a revolutionary new tool, but a lot of people kind of see it as, well, it's a step forward, right, in software development. So you really have a majority saying, we need to evaluate this. And I think that's really important to understand that when you hear companies saying, oh, we're, uh, we're laying off people because of AI. I think that's about as legitimate as somebody saying, well, you know, the world is flat because of science. Uh, we're still evaluating things, folks. Um, so AI is used in many applications right now, okay? Automation number one. And I just want to give you an example. My mom always taught me, if you want to mention something like automation, give an example, James. Well, Red Hat, IBM came up with a long time ago, a, an automation tool called Ansible, it's, which is really cool. Just a few lines. If you look at the bottom of that slide, you can launch a thousand cloud images. You can update a thousand servers. You get the idea just with a few lines. It's really groovy stuff. Well, imagine Ansible combined with IBM's Watson so that you can do AI. That's to me, automation. That's pretty interesting. We've been using a uh, uh, Bayesian analytics, uh, a Bayesian the algorithm and data analytics for years. And again, in spam filters. So there's some of those things. You know, Shane, that's a really good question. I don't think many accountants lost their jobs after the invention of the calculator, right? They simply went on to identify and create more value for their organizations. That's why uh, CPAs are considered very valuable knowledge workers rather than people who crunch numbers, right? Uh, at least the good, CP uh, the good CPAs. So great question, Shane. Functional areas where AI is needed. Here are the four areas where people really feel it needs to be. And notice it goes along those four pillars. We didn't come up with those idea of the four pillars because of the survey. We came up with the four pillars idea, my goodness, like 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago. Um, so notice that's really where people are wanting to focus. And people really need to understand the fundamentals of AI. And so here we go. And, and I would argue when it comes to cybersecurity, if you don't upgrade yourself and, and if you don't accept what I would call negotiate with the inevitable, you could lose your job. AI can make you lose your job for a couple of reasons. One, a company can just kind of say, because of AI, we're doing layoffs when maybe not really. But AI will automate certain things that we are doing right now. A lot of our uh, work, uh, here's a friend of mine, this friend of mine who uh, told me he works for Google. Uh, he said that he feels that of his team, that uh, up until they started using AI, he felt he only got about 12 to 15 hours of useful work a week out of people who worked 40, 50 hours. And I said, what, are they lazy? He said, no, they, they're just doing repetitive tasks that AI can do for them. Okay. What's the challenge with AI? The challenge is that, and I'm just going to focus on the number one one. And by the way, you'll get a copy of these slides at the end. I've got a QR code. You can download these slides and I'll chain, I'll make them available to you in kit uh, in an email afterwards uh, so you can distribute them as you wish. But notice it's all about determining the best AI and human interaction. And to me, it's all about what I call the interstice. And that's a fancy word for saying the space in between, if I get my fingers together, the space in between AI and the human. That's the interaction. That's really important. 
Now, let me talk to you about cybersecurity. Oh, let me stop right here real quick. Shane, were there any uh, questions that I haven't answered? Actually, or... Surprisingly enough, no, there's been oh. no actual questions. So uh, keep on talking to us. About okay. Stuff, well, I must be boring Feel everybody. Free. I'll try to be more interesting, folks. Check out these people here. Some of these people work for companies you probably heard of, Coca-Cola. One of them works for a company called Veritas. If you haven't heard of them, you should, because Veritas has learned more about IT backup right then then most people will ever know in fact they i think they've forgotten more about it that, uh, backup than most people know but uh, uh if you've ever heard of uh, a company called state farm they're an insurance company very large one in the united states these are all it workers that are looking for confidence here's somebody who's the ciso for dell dell computers all of these people are looking for confidence and so you could say well isn't that great we'll use ai to get confidence right here ends the webinar we're done right well it ain't that easy. So we asked leaders like the people I was just showing you a very unfair question. And it was, hey, what one thing would fix cybersecurity? It's not really a fair question, but it's an interesting one. What will improve cybersecurity? And here are their answers. Now, you'll notice they don't say better end user training. They do, but only about 11, 12 percent. Improved risk management was another big one. But notice the really big amount of numbers there it involves sorry about that i almost knocked over my uh <laughs> knocked over my uh my computer here the biggest number involves network and analytics notice where it says application network monitoring and data notice that that's because they really feel that one of the ways that is going to really improve cybersecurity is figuring out where the hackers are. And where are the hackers? They can be lots of places. I always say they're not necessarily in evil Russia or evil America or Australia or whatever. They're in our applications. They're in our data because that's where users are and that's where the money is. So, uh, and you know, James, uh, good question. Uh, uh, I think he, uh, this is Francois Mestre. That's his name. He is the CIO for the European Center for Disease Control. And yes, we bonded over our hair. Uh, I asked him, what is really worrying you or what is really important to you when it comes to cybersecurity? And he said, we really need to figure out automation because he is being inundated with requests. And these are great requests, but they're requests that that before COVID, he would rarely get people who were interested in his solutions. You know, the researchers, the doctors just weren't too interested. After co During and after COVID, he said they're breaking the door down. See these people? These are the CIOs of, uh, let's see, uh, the one with the white beard is the CIO for the University of Cambridge in the UK. The guy in the middle there is for the is the CIO for the uh, for Oxford University guy on the left for Edinburgh University. They also are very interested in automation. What are they trying to automate here? Well, take a look at this picture. Do you see something in the middle of the picture? See if you can type in to the chat window what you see there real quick if you don't mind. Can you see that? Just try that in the interest of time, we don't have a whole lot of time. So that's right, Nikki. Yeah, it's definitely a mammal. It's not a big cat. It is, in fact, a grizzly bear. And I saw that as I was hiking in the Grand Teton National Park. And um, my family saw that bear and very quickly kind of jogged away from it. I got closer to it, as you can see. Um, and that's her looking up and going, why is that stupid guy getting so close? The reason I show this bear is as cybersecurity analysts, our job is to look for threat actors and we are looking through a forest of data and we need automation and AI to help us find that threat actor. The big question of course is, was Jane Stanger the threat actor or was Ms. Grizzly Bear the threat actor? I'll leave it up to you, but we also look for patterns. Check out this picture. Um, in Seattle, it rains a whole lot. And, and if you're up in the air and lucky enough for it not to be raining, you can see these four mountains. I think it's four. Rainier is the big one and there's others, Adams, St. Helens, the one that blew up about 1980, and Hood. That's R-A-S-H, rash. That's a pattern. My point is, when it comes to cybersecurity, it's not just one thing to find the threat actor. It's to find the patterns of attack, the indicators of attack, indicators of compromise. Because it's all about the applications. That's Stephen Tigat and his wife. He lives in Belgium. Um, there's another lady. Her name is Vandana Verma. She, Verma excuse me. She lives in India. Both of them would say that application security is very important. And this is so important and that AI is relevant here because we need artificial intelligence to be done right 
so that we can find out what's going on there. We need automation to help improve red team and blue team dynamics. And by red and blue team, I'm talking about pen tester, the red blue team are the security analysts, okay? They're kind of both sides of the same coin as it were, right? We also can use artificial intelligence to help governance and risk management. Specifically, if we get threat information or information about the computer systems, the applications, the tools that we use every day to get our job done, if we can automate the inventory of that, it will help people in governance. This is a lady named Julie Brierly. She happens to live in the United States. And her job is as governance uh, manager to make sure that people in organizations, in companies, governments, that if they say they're following a certain set of rules like GDPR in Europe or HIPAA, which is a healthcare rule in the United States, that they actually are following them. Now, I talk with these people every day and they say, you know, James, there are a lot of gaps. And I'm like, well, what do you mean gaps? And people will often talk about the skills gap. And that's fine. You know, there are people who have skills gaps. There is a gap out there. Uh, I was just talking today about a, a to a network a, a developer for uh, a, a Linux developer who creates a lot of the tools that you use every day when you use Linux. And he said there he's having a hard time finding people. But I like to talk about gaps more in terms of confidence. Now, there's a two people here. The top guy there, his name is Tim Carruthers. The bottom person there, her name uh, is uh, uh, Alyssa Ortsman. Alyssa works for Christie's. You ever heard of that auction house that, you know, whenever there's a, a, a million dollar painting or a hundred million dollar painting, it's Christie's that sells it. Tim works for Google. So you have two different sectors here, the tech sector and the, you could argue the retail sector, right? Because they sell stuff. They both are saying, we're not at a minimum area of viability yet where we can use AI profitably. Now think about that for a second. And when they when I say profitably, I don't mean to make money. I mean to use AI intelligently and well. And that's because they feel that it's really important to get your processes in a in a your ducks in a row to mature your processes. And these both of these guys, trust me, both these people have very good and mature organizations. But I hear the same thing. These are state leaders in the United States, um, actually city leaders. One of these persons, the one on the on the right, um, is uh, the CISO for the state for the city of Chicago. Uh, these are also people who work for Microsoft, for Cisco, and others. The idea is that they don't see enough maturity in IT operations. Uh, they use the phrase, I've heard the phrase, this is one, uh, there's uh, Vandana again. She said, a lot of companies do a lot of magic. And I said, well, well, what do you mean by magic? She said, well, they skip steps. I'm like, what do you mean steps? It's like, well, they don't, they're not given enough time to implement a project, so they have to skip steps along the way. And that incurs something called technical debt. And I'll talk about that more. But the idea is that we need to get skills to iterate to improve step by step, little by little, our way out of those problems. These leaders all face the problems you're looking at right now. And there's basically four of them, okay? Those four things are technical debt, shadow IT, poor communication, and immature processes, okay? That's uh, my uh, that's my daughter-in-law uh, holding my first grandkid, uh, uh, just as an idea of a you know baby process, right? So I'm going to talk about what these things are. Technical debt, shadow IT, poor communication, et cetera. So technical debt simply means this. You skip steps along the way. And there is a cost that is incurred. It's a debt that happens. Thanks, Troy, for the congrats. You know, the technical debt thing is a serious problem. Because if you skip a step, for example, you use an old version of Linux, or you use an old uh, a system that hasn't been patched right, or you skip software development step, you incur a debt. And if you don't pay it back, what happens? Well, it's the same thing that happens when you don't pay a debt on your car. You lose your car or your house, right? Technical debt is a serious thing because the, one of the reasons, not the only, but one of the reasons why we get hit by ransomware, by advanced persistent threats, by cybersecurity is because we don't pay back our technical debt. I'm a scuba diver. And as a scuba diver, when I go down deep and I breathe compressed air, I incur a debt. And if I come up too fast, right, I can end up with something called the bends where you get nitrogen in your system, right? And it goes into your tissues and it's extremely painful, can be paralyzing and deadly. We will talk as scuba divers about as you go down and stay too long, you have to stop and do a decompression stop. Why? Because you have to pay off that debt. 
Because if you stop for a while, say at 60 feet, and then again at 20 feet, that nitrogen will go away and you won't have that debt anymore. That's my point about technical debt. Shadow IT is relatively simple and I'm gonna gotta move on here faster because I'm taking too long. But shadow IT is simply this. Um, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, even five years ago, if you had to build a web server, how would you do that? Well, you'd have to find a room to put it in. You'd have to find the physical hardware, someone to run it, the electricity for it, the internet bandwidth, the operating system. You get it, you have to install it. What does it mean now to launch a uh, hundred web servers? How hard would it be if you have a little bit of budget and the cloud? I'm not saying you would do it right, but what happens in IT now is that Companies will have departments that are like, well, the IT department's busy. We're going to start our own solution. You know, the research department will set up its own cloud system and maybe even connect it to the rest of the network. Now you have IT that's living in the shadows. Nobody knows where it is. That's dangerous. The lack of communication is the number one, the number one problem. And as a result, you end up with what I call cowboy IT. And I love cowboy movies, but I'm using cowboy tea as a bad thing, like shooting from the hip and just kind of not following the rules. And what you end up with is a situation where Woody in uh, Toy Story says, somebody's poison the water hole, right? So it's problematic practices. You're not using modern practices. You're using old practices. It's bad communication. And I would argue this is a problem that exists and has existed for a long time. Check out this slide here. On the left side of the slide, these are good practices. We fix problems as they come up. We do good change management. We mature our processes with governance. We have good project management. We, we have empathy for people, developers, uh, so that don't have time, so we give them more time. Writing ability. These are all very important skills. Now look on the right. These are problem areas where we skip steps during the software lifecycle or implementing a server or connecting a database to a, to a web server, things like that. Those are serious issues that cause cowboy IT or cause these problems. And I say it's really important to get to the root causes here and AI can help us do this. So AI can help us if we get our ducks in a row. If not, AI will make things even worse. And I wanna bring up some ancient ideas. See this picture here of this tree that is called a bristle cone pine tree. That's the oldest living thing. It's not me, believe it or not. It's this tree. That tree is about 5,000 years old, still alive. It's the same tree that, that was born 5,000 years ago. And I'm going to talk to you about some old ideas because can AI help us? We asked 500, a little over 500 IT leaders, can AI help us? And notice what their answers were. If you take a careful look at this, it basically says, 22% actually say it can moderately make worse. 15.5% say it can make a lot worse. 25% say it'll make it worse. The majority think AI can actually mess things up more than fix things. Why? Because we haven't got our IT ducks in a row. Do you really want to automate dysfunction? Trust me, I've had four kids. Well, my wife had four kids. Uh, and uh, I know what it means to have dysfunction. I know what it means to have automatic, you know, uh, uh, things running around causing problems, right? Um, we don't want that. So I, I love Amazon SageMaker. I love automation, but you have to get it right. This is that slide. Uh, this is a slide that shows how the Bayes algorithm the, uh, of AI has been helping us for some time. So I'm not against AI at all. We've been using it for years. So this eye chart of a slide is showing how a, a spam filter works. And that, that feature extraction, that machine learning model application that's been around for decades, right? It's really cool, it's groovy. Let's talk about two types of AI. I think most of us know there's predictive and generative. The, the type of AI that has captured the public imagination in a fairly appalling way uh, is generative AI. You know, we're talking about Gemini, we're talking about, uh, 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 chat GPT. And I find it interesting that Gemini is named, uh, used to be called Bard. You know, that's Google's products called Gemini. I find it interesting that, that it's called Gemini because what does Gemini mean? Last I heard, it means twin, right? Or double, two, right? And I'm a big believer that AI, working with AI is very important. If you just leave AI to do work for you and then you just copy and paste or something like that, I'm not sure you're being creative. You might be being clever. I'm not sure you're being truly creative. So I'm going to go more into this. But I want to say something about how generative AI is fine. But remember, it's a large language model that uses statistics that then 
you know, comes up with uh, language that we think is appropriate and statistically it can come up with good stuff. But I think it's important to talk about how predictive AI is very important. And, and Deepak here, uh, I won't go into the detail here, but he basically likes precision AI. And he feels that not generative, but predictive AI is more precise. Um, he's the chief financial officer. He's a CPA. Uh, precision is very important, right? So I think that's part of it. I think the other part of it is if we use AI, it's very important that both people, both people are going to solve that problem. So if we're going to solve problems with AI, this is taken from a, I took this from a previous slide in data or cybersecurity or IT and software management. How do we do that? Well, here's somebody named Kash. Kash Awan, he lives in Seattle, Washington, uh, near me. He manages a team of AI engineers. Uh, and this, these five teams that he works with, they do U.S. government work. They work with, for banks worldwide for healthcare. And his job is to make sure that Data modeling helps assist human decisions. And this is the first thing I want you to think about. AI's job is to help human beings make better decisions. It's not that human beings go to AI and let the AI make decisions. Trust me, that is a line that everybody crosses and has crossed and will continue to cross unless they've been educated. Again, AI assists human decision making. And it can automate things, but it's very important that you have good policies at the end of it. Otherwise, you have chaos. What do I mean by chaos? Check out, you can Google this, the uh, Canada, uh, there was an AI bot for Canada Airlines, came up with its own policy about miles. That created chaos. Uh, there's a problem right now going on in the UK, has been for years, called the UK Post scandal, Postmaster scandal. AI wasn't directly involved in that, but... It was the use of, artif of, of, excuse me, of uh, automation, and it was the use of systems that people just blindly believed in. And I think the first thing you have to understand is that we need people who, yes, understand cloud architectures. We need people who understand development. We need people who understand project management, all these types of skills. That's great. But what we really need, uh, cybersecurity, all that, but what we really need are people who can work with AI in a skeptical, not a cynical, but a skeptical way so that they can work and work in a productive way with AI. And that's one of the lessons that this lady taught me. Her name is Rachel Singleton. She taught me that that's so important because you have to learn the fundamentals of AI and that means listening to AI. And that way we can work and play with AI as a coworker. And we can apply what I would call the Gemini or the twin model where AI and human beings work together. What do you guys see here in this little picture? You see two people looking at each other or you see that that chalice, that, that cup, right? You see both things. I argue that there is a very important and precious relationship that happens between any two people when they communicate properly. Same thing can happen in a sense with AI if we communicate properly, and that's a big thing. Plato taught us this. He didn't teach us about AI, of course, but he taught us how, what it means to work and play well with people. I would argue that we can let AI do 80% of the repetitive work and then we as human beings add a little bit extra. And that little bit extra is what I would consider unique value. In the United States, there's an old myth. And it's actually, it's a folk tale about a person who actually lived. His name was John Henry. John Henry got in a competition with a steam drill back in the late 19th century. A steam drill drills holes, huge tunnels through mountains. And he said, hey, I can beat that steam drill. And he actually did. The story goes that he actually beat the drill. The problem is he died immediately thereafter because he was exhausted. What's the lesson to be learned here? Well, don't get in the competition with AI. Negotiate with the inevitable and let AI do its thing. And then you figure out how to work and do unique things. And I'll be talking about what those unique things are. Because I would argue when it comes to observing and orienting and deciding and acting, any human being that can leverage AI properly will be more valuable than a human being who doesn't. Most of the times, right? So it's not let the AI do things and be smug about it. It's let's work with AI. And I'll bet you five bucks, folks, that will require more human work, right, than you'd think. But don't worry, AI will do that repetitive stuff. It'll give you time. But that means there's a burden on you and a debt on you that you have to pay to work really hard. Give you a case in point real quick. And I've got to, boy, I've got to go faster. 
I decided to get in a in a dialogue with ChatGPT, and I did some ChatGPT ego surfing. I looked, I asked, "Hey, who is Jane Stanger?" And it said, "Well, he's the chief technology and security. Uh, I don't like that word expert. He's the chief technology evangelist." So this is, you know, look at that. That's me. But check this out. It says that I wrote the CompTIA Cloud Essential Certification Study Guide and Security Plus, and it says that I'm Idle Foundation certified. I don't have any of those. I've I've written lots of books, but I haven't read those, uh, written those. And I said, hey, uh, are, we, are you sure you got the right James Stanger? He says, yeah, you know, it's a common name, which I'm not sure James Stanger is a very common name. But anyway, but it says, you know, yeah, this is James Stanger from CompTIA, right? He's done things. So that's right. And I said, well, does James Stanger have a PhD? And uh, so uh, ChatGPT gave me you know, a few uh, idle certifications and a few books, but it took away my PhD because I do have a, a PhD in unemployment uh, in British romantic literature. Uh, but it took that away, but it gave me a bachelor's degree in international studies and an MBA and even a couple of certs that I don't have. So my point is, it's very important to engage in a strong dialogue. And that's, you could call that prompt engineering. Here are some examples in cybersecurity of how you can engage in prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is simply a fancy way of saying, asking good questions of AI. Prompt, you know, is a question. Not prompt as in speedy, but prompt as in, okay, he prompted me for a question. Speaking of which, there seem to be a couple of QA here, people, uh, questions here. I guess cybersecurity privacy concerns as a challenge. Uh, yeah, those are uh, uh, those kind of scenarios, I would agree. Uh, 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 Troy, another question, rather than refer to AI, should we be changing the language to augmented intelligence? That's a great question. I would agree with that. It has to be augmented. But I would argue that sometimes that artificial intelligence becomes superficial intelligence because we're just copying and pasting stuff rather than really evaluating. So let's turn superficial intelligence into augmented intelligence. That's a great question. So prompt engineering simply means asking good questions. So here are uh, you know, various topics, and I have to go very quickly over these. Just want you to take a look at them. From incident response to threat intelligence, pen testing, et cetera, to you know, identity management, here are some questions that you could ask AI, whether it be ChatGPT or Gemini or whatever private AI tool you might have going. This is what I mean by asking good questions. Now, I'll come to an example of something called data labeling. And what you're looking at right now are, are pictures that a picture that I took um, in the uh, Zion National Park in Utah of pronghorn sheep. Those are sheep, wild sheep. They were right on the side of the road, and these are sheep that have been labeled, right? And so have a couple other things. See that rock wall? What those things are? That's geofencing, you could call it, but that's labeling, data tagging. AI relies on data labeling all day long. Right, and I was talking with a contractor uh, who, for a social media organization, a very large company, huge, very controversial one, in fact. And I asked her what she does. She said, "I work with AI agents in different domains. Domains meaning customer experience, meaning uh, you know, uh, women, uh, you know, uh, IT, you know, whatever interests right people have." And these agents talk with the platform's user, and she uses data labeling to refine the accuracy and performance of these agents. So if you better label the conversations and the images and the things that are going on, it helps this company make sure that they meet standards. So there are things that you have to learn when it comes to cybersecurity or IT having to do with, well, how did you come up with this data? Are you transparent? Can you explain how you came to your conclusion? These are all very important skills. Here's a group of people. See that tall drink of water there? The guy with the beard, right? The tallest one. His name is Bill Newhouse. He has worked for the Department of, for the National Institute of Standards and Technology on data labeling as well. And what he does, whoops, what he does is he makes sure that as they implement cybersecurity and data, data um, uh, zero trust, excuse me, zero trust, that they label data and also label applications and processes to make it easier for automation and AI to identify bad behavior. And in fact, if you look at all those people, uh, that gentleman on to the right, uh, the, the shorter gentleman, his name is Glenn Hernandez, the, the guy next to him, uh, uh, his name is uh, John Dvorak. Uh, he used to work for the FBI. All of them, uh, are, uh, he now works for Red Hat. All of them have uh, worked very closely with using uh, uh, AI and, and cybersecurity. Now, let me give you, I think, a final example here uh, about AI and how it can be used, right? Um, 
I've done pen testing before. Uh, here's an example of what you could do. Uh, anybody who understands pen testing knows that what a pen tester will do is they'll do discovery. And you can use AI for that, right? Why not? You could use any tool. Any good pen tester uses any tool that comes to hand. Well, let's say you've discovered that a particular system that you are penetration testing, and I'm not suggesting you break into things. I'm suggesting you become a licensed pen tester. There's a difference. Or a contracted pen tester. Well, anyway, uh, this is a common vulnerability, uh, uh, a CVE uh, uh, report. Uh, a very common one about something called Papercut. Papercut is a very good piece of software. It's used to manage printers around the world. Really good stuff. Well, uh, everybody makes mistakes and there is a, a problem, an exposure, right? A CVE, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposure Alert. Well, let's say I am pen testing a company that has that. Well, I could do a search for Showdown and find out who has that paper cut vulnerability or if the company that I'm pen testing does, right? And what I can do now is use AI. Instead of creating a script myself or hoping that somebody else has, I can go up to chat GPT and I can say, hey, can you write a Python script that takes an IP address and a specific, uh, specific port number, right? In this case, um, the port number for paper cut. And look at this, it'll create a script for me. Now, ChatGPT doesn't know I'm creating a script that will break into something, but there's the port 4096. Do you see that? And it's saying, look, here's here's the what you can do. And you can even save that into a script. And it even shows you how you can run that against a port. Now, the question is, what does this teach you, right? Have I just taught you to use artificial intelligence to hack? I hope not. I hope you can act more ethically than that. But what does this teach you? And these are questions that we talked about. See these people, these are all uh, workers. Uh, uh, most of these live in Canberra, but these are all workers. Uh, one of those actually lives in Port, uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, but these are people who all understand the value of automation. But they taught me a few things. They said, first of all, check your resources. Who's to say if this code is actually going to work? Okay. Who's to say that maybe there's better code that as a pen tester, is more efficient, is less noisy. As a pen tester, you don't want to be noisy, right? You want to do this without being seen or heard, right? By a security analyst as much as possible. So if this can be done, you know, to create, you know, if you can use this to create this, what unique skills then can you, do you bring to bear as a pen tester? Because eventually they're going to be able to automate this kind of work so that it'll take human beings out of the loop. So as a pen tester, that means that you just have to step your game up a bit. You have to move your skills, I would argue, northward, or some people call it a leftward shift, right? So I think when it comes to AI, think about ways in which you can move from the old ways and old paradigms to new paradigms. To think less in terms of the defender's dilemma, which is, well, if one person makes a mistake, the whole company gets you know destroyed, right? To the attacker's dilemma. Do you realize how many steps a pen tester has to take or an attacker has to take to be successful? How can we make that more efficient to discover the attacker? Cybersecurity from the ground up is great. Uh, governments around the world have gotten together and said, let's go with secure by design. And I love that idea. I do find, though, that people kind of want to secure things by design, but then skip steps. So I think iteration, step-by-step -step improvement. How can we enlist AI to do that? How can we enlist AI to think to help leaders think more strategically to include our uh, technology and technologists and the CIO early on um, in every business decision? How can we move from signature-based detection, you know, antivirus, to fancy word here, heuristic detection, where AI really gets into the nitty gritty and starts looking for hacker pivots? That's already happening, but how can you help that? How can you benefit from that, more importantly? And how can you engage in a dialogue with that? As we move from, as we've moved really from perimeter-based thinking, you know, inside and outside to zero trust and identity, where identity is the new perimeter, how can AI help us with that? More, most importantly, how can we move from isolated decision making to assisted AI in the loop decision making? Uh, that will help us move from the typical, oh, he's good to go, he authenticated this morning, to, well, you may have authenticated, but you know, his system could have gotten attacked at any time. So we need to think in terms of contingency and context. So I've talked for way too long. Folks, there are pathways that you can go on. Uh, when it comes to your job as a cybersecurity worker or your interest in it, think about how you can cooperate with the inevitable, how you can help organizations with 
iteration, how you can help people think laterally to improve processes so that you don't just unleash AI on an unsuspecting company, but that you actually use AI in a, in a truly dialogue in an important way. We need tech skills. I love tech skills. I'd rather geek out on tech skills than anything, but I'm more interested in making sure that we can improve the processes of a, of a company and make it possible for AI to work. Uh, if you've never heard of CompTIA before, we have a whole pathway that I'd love to talk to you about at some point, uh, various pathways in data, infrastructure, et cetera. We also have a lot of free research. You can go out and take a look at it. Uh, the cybersecurity report for 2024. There's the IT industry outlook for 2024. In fact, you can go back through the years and take a look at previous ones to see what kind of trends have been developing. I'm happy to talk with you, uh, uh, communicate with you uh, via LinkedIn. If you want to do that, you don't have to, but that'd be great if you did. Uh, so join me on LinkedIn. And if you want these slides, uh, there's a, a few articles I've written over the last year or two. But if you want these slides, you can download them here. You can, if you trust QR codes, or you can take a picture of that and type in that uh, really ugly URL there. So Shane, I've boy, I've talked a lot, uh, but I'm uh, happy to uh, answer think, any questions that folks have. Uh, so far, we don't have uh, many questions, although Jeffrey did ask one, which I'll get to in a minute. One sure. thing I will say, um, James, is that there's a lot more in that than I think you had time to um, yeah, look yeah, through probably. and. Uh, yeah. And people who are watching the YouTube video, because we do post these onto our YouTube channel and they'll be up there tomorrow and people will be able to stop and look at the slides as well as get the um, the downloads of them sure. as well. So, uh, you know, it'll give people a bit of a chance to look through all that stuff. And there's there's a lot of things that I would have liked to have heard more about, I must say. As a well, hey, Although, what it can do is if you want, I can come back and we can talk about a section of those things. Yeah. Yeah, it was very interesting. I, it, to me, it strikes me that business rules, getting your business rules right is, as always, the foundation of any of this stuff. It's got to be really important. Uh, and, and those business rules involve things like ethics, involves things like customer experience, believe it or not, really thinking about that. But the rules also have to do with coming up with really, truly, how should I put this, realistic expectations for how we implement tech. And I'm not sure a lot of companies have that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Kit's just messaging me saying, plan your dive, dive your plan. That's <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Oh, the QR code's not working. Sounds like I blew it with the QR code, folks. I'm sorry. That's not good. We will um, we'll post the slides anyway in, okay. um, uh, up uh, somewhere in the, the channel or a link to them on our site. Okay. Um, so you ever be able to get those? Jeffrey did ask earlier on a question, and I'm just trying to find it. Sure. Um, well, actually, there's a couple of session questions here. While we so Drew's asked, any advice for somebody starting out in cyber? He's starting a cert four, which I cert four is a um, is a pre uni sort of course here. Mm -hmm. So he's studying for that course, and then did you, what was the question? Uh, is there any advice? advice for somebody who's you know get at that very beginning stage? Great. You know, my favorite piece of advice, and it might be a little too early for you, but I, I don't think so. If you hear about a, if you read about an acronym, you know, and how many bazillions, right, Shane, acronyms are there out there? Yeah. And we used AI and ML and what TCP/IP. Here's my thing: uh, if you hear an acronym, try to find do two one of two things. One, ask an expert about what it is, right? Get their take on it. Two, hands-on experience. And I'm really big on, you could, you, you could use the fancy phrase, kinesthetic learning, which means hands-on. In other words, I create a playground and I use something called VM um, uh, VirtualBox, right? If you've heard of VMware, I use VirtualBox. It's from Oracle. You can download it for free, right? Uh, and then you can download Linux systems and, and old Windows systems. Microsoft lets you download them. You can't use them uh, fully, but you can use them to pen test with or to mess around with. Play around with the technologies. As you're getting started, think about ways that you can hands-on learn about this stuff. If you learn, for example, about the TCP handshake, right? The three-way handshake, download a, a Wireshark and, and download a packet capture. There are websites that have packet captures of the TCP handshake and look at it. Instead of just reading about it, try to implement it as much as possible. So there's some advice. That's great. Um, got a couple more questions as well. Um, Rob's asking what your perspective would be on AI having been drowned by IT at Google. Having been drowned? 
Mm. I don't know what that means. I'm assuming something like, you know, the IT department, you know, have killed it in one way or another. Well, one thing that's I'll say about this is that artificial intelligence is going to be a tool. Eventually, it might start using us, right? Uh, but if we're clever, which I hope we are as human beings, sometimes I, I begin to wonder, certainly about myself, if we're clever enough, we will still find ways to make sure that we have policies so that we don't drown in AI or we don't drown the creativity that AI can bring us. I think AI can bring us a tremendous amount of benefits as long as there are ethics and as long as there's intelligence on both sides of the equation. I, I, so I'm not sure I know what what uh, that means. He, he said it was a comment more than a question. Okay. Uh, yeah. Jeffrey asked earlier, is, it, is AI then really similar to the old decision support systems? That we used yeah, to have. actually it is. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. that is a form of context-based um, decision helping. I'm not sure it improved by itself though, right? That's where I would say it's not proper AI, but it's very closely related. Mm. By the way, I have a, a really lame joke. You want to hear it? Nobody thinks it's funny, so don't, don't <laughs> laugh. You don't have to. Uh, what language is used for machine learning? What There are many of them. What are some of the languages used for machine learning? Does anybody know? Like Python, right? or Java, right? Those are language. What language is used? Here's the punchline. What, what language is used for artificial intelligence? And the answer is PowerPoint slides. Um, I tell that joke because I like to talk about AI in a real way rather than just as a, as a something magic or whatever. So there you go. David's asked, do we not need to consider AI being encouraged to do the wrong thing too and deliberately giving bad information? So we should be altering the training data to lean in a direction as well as jailbreaking. That's comments. a terrific question. I think you're right. Um, AI is like a child. If you don't train a child, what happens? Or if you train a child incorrectly, what happens? I think we've all been regaled with terrible examples of how AI has been used intentionally, but also how it has not been trained properly and it comes up with terrible conclusions based on the data, conclusions about race, class, gender, things like that, that are uh, really terrible. And some of that's based on the data sets that's vetted. You must train artificial intelligence. And there's two types of training, pre and post. Okay. In other words, you have to take the data because data is the beast that feeds AI. I, 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 let's put it this way. Data feeds the AI beast. So you have to make sure the data that you put in is accurate. I would argue that that ego surfing example I gave shows that, well, there was either two James Stangers that got concatenated, you know, shifted into one, or they just use some bogus data, right? So you have to make your data trainable and normalize it. So you have to have good data analytics. That's one of the first things. The second part of training is once AI is going, it still needs to be trained. And I would argue there's a third element. As a human being, you have to have been taught the ethics and the intelligence and the judgment to go, okay, I don't buy that. Okay. And I think that's really important, really interesting to think about. Yeah, it, it is interesting. We're, um, I don't know if you know that much about us, but we partner with the university here in Australia to deliver <laughs> IT courses. And one of the moves from the university is to increasingly include ethics as a fundamental subject in every IT course. And I think it was funny. Um, I think that, and it's ethics, you know, first of all, you could talk about local ethics. When I say local ethics, if you're learning about pen testing, do you have the local ethics to not use those tools on something that you have no business even doing or thinking about, right? That's what I mean by local ethics. I also think there's a, a real ethics that organizations need to build in to their systems, to their processes. I will use the UK as an example. This post office scandal, you could Google that. U UK post office scandal. AI wasn't involved, but what happened was is it, it basically was that the culture of the post office basically trusted computers more than it did their own processes. So when the computers came up and said, hey, Shane, James, Kit, you as postmasters, every month we've seen that you there's a shortfall. You're obviously stealing thousands of pounds every 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 month. You owe me 32,000 pounds. That's what happened. And there was no way to argue with the machine. With, and it wasn't even AI they were arguing with. Now, imagine if AI was involved, how much worse could that get? Or could AI, if it was done right, have fixed that problem? But see, that's a cultural, not a technical problem. 
And I would argue cybersecurity is not really a technical problem. It's more of a leadership and, and cultural problem. And I don't necessarily mean cultural in terms of Australia or the United States. I mean cultural in terms of how an organization works. Yes, there's uh, there's been a couple of comments, and and I was interested in one of the slides very early on, where you, only about twelve or fifteen percent of people said that training staff was the uh, was the most important thing. Isn't that funny. And that, that is the uh, and the one of the conversations going on in the uh, in the chat has been about a, a thing called robo debt, which was our version of the post office scandal. I don't know if you've heard of that. No, no I'm ignorant to that. Okay, it was a, yeah. essentially a computer algorithm that determined welfare if welfare recipients owed a debt to the government based upon averaging out the income that they declared over an extended period of time. Ah. and of course. You know, it, it led to horrific consequences because it was wrong in most cases and was, you know, uh, sending debts to people of thousands of dollars for the very people oh who were least able to pay them. People, you know, killed themselves over it. It was horrendous. This, and again, you know, I, and again, geez, I would never want to get political and I don't mean to really pick on the, the UK or, or, or others, but I do think there are serious issues to think about in any company culture, and I've seen it in very small companies, in very large companies, governments, where the processes kind of get out of the way, right? And people did kill themselves in both the robo debt, it sounds like, and in the UK postal yeah. scheme. So, and I realized the AI was not directly involved in that, but I'm just saying we have to make sure we don't unleash AI on bad processes, or even more importantly, maybe unleash bad processes on AI. You know what I mean? Yeah, it just doesn't Ab work. Absolutely. If you, uh, somebody said before, garbage in, garbage out. It's the same old thing. Um, and I guess you know, I suppose I should have just said that at the beginning, and then we could have had more <laughs> discussion, <laughs> right? Because that's what this is. It's the old concept, right? Yep. I'm assuming the answer to this question is simply is yes. But combined with the possibility of quantum computing, are modern encryption practices at risk? Uh, yes, they are. Uh, there's a reason why. Uh, just so you know, uh, uh, one of the persons I was telling you about, Bill Newhouse, his job is to help create post-quantum cryptography, that he moved from data labeling to actually creating post-quantum cryptography. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, he realized that's a serious problem. Yeah. And see where it says Shane, where it's Shane, where it says NIST is working on a new cryptography. Um, that that friend of mine, a uh, person I know, his name is Bill Newhouse. He is working on that cryptography to address the quantum threat. The quantum threat involves really fast, incredibly capable computers that are now democratized. It's just a fancy way of saying more people have them. They're incredibly powerful and they're easier to get. And AI is another element of that, another equation to that. Yep. Uh, Brad's just as a comment suggested, let's go a step further and change the language to actual intelligence as presented. It's the insights that's the key. I like that. Insights. I like that. As long as it's not superficial intelligence or copy and paste intelligence, but actual intelligence. I like that. Um, you know, and of course, we're going to see the, uh, the four, uh, was it Forbes who came up with this? The, the, uh, Hype cycle involved here, right? Uh, yeah. there, whatever technology you can think of, you know, used to be maybe blockchain or 3D printing, or I remember Linux being part of that, right? You know, it, it starts here and then inflated expectations. It's going to cure everything, including, you know, uh, my bad relationship with my mother-in-law. Uh, and then all of a sudden, oh, it does nothing. It's silly. It's wasted. And then it kind of levels off. And I think we're, you know, we're at that height, heightened expectation, maybe a little bit over. It'll work its way into reality. Absolutely. It seems to be casting a bit of a shadow over, you know, we yeah. see it in course demand, for example, it, you know, it affects course demand for other courses. Yeah. Ivan or Ivan has said, do we still need even an extensive knowledge of programming languages for the cybersecurity in the future? That's a fantastic question. It's a fantastic question. Remember, ChatGPT, right, is going to come up with code. I wouldn't, or I would argue that it would not necessarily be the best code. And if it is good code, it's going to get you 80% there. So yeah, that just means that your job will be to come up with a better 20%. Yeah. So if if you do coding and you've, con <laughs> you've uh, what's the word? Conned everybody into thinking that your repetitive code is so unique, then you're in trouble. If you actually go, hey, I'll let ChatGPT do the, the the throwaway stuff. Great. I'll contribute that unique element. You're fine. Yeah. 
Well, it comes down to things. It wasn't there a uh, an outage just recently because somebody had given a free piece of code that did timing or something, yeah. and 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 in a huff at um, uh, I forget who it was, um, uh, GitHub or something. He yeah. took his code off GitHub and everybody's timing went out. Right, <laughs> stopped the whole pile of stuff because yeah. he'd just done a five line bit of code twenty years ago. Yeah, that's interesting. I, you know, I have seen predictions that say accounting, uh, some a lot of programming might really be under threat, right? Because uh, because of the way uh, mathematically we can, you know, probably automate a lot of these things. Man, I, if I could tell the future folks, I'd tell you, you know, uh, and we'd all, you know, buy an island and live happily ever after. I do think, though, that... Um, in the same way that uh, certain accounting jobs did go away when people, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of accounting software out there that allows you to do your taxes. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Right? Did that get rid of CPAs? It probably made meant a few CPAs had to do something else, right? Yeah. But I the, qu the question is: Is it the industrial revolution over again, or is it the invention of PCs changing what we've already done by hand? It's a great question. I do think AI is going to change a lot of workflows and it will come to the point where it will start eliminating jobs. There's no question in the same way that the automobile eliminated blacksmiths. Maybe right? that's a problem we can put to AI is how to resolve the uh, disruption that's inevitably yeah. going to happen. Yeah. And I think it could be extremely destructive this time. You know, yeah. when, when blacksmiths were eliminated, um, it took, you know, decades for that to happen. Uh, yeah. I think there are a lot of jobs that could get eliminated uh, very quickly once AI becomes more capable. Um, uh, that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is, no, uh, go back to that calculator example at the beginning of the webinar. That didn't you know, get rid of CPAs or eliminate a lot of these jobs. Uh, yeah. It just made the, the people more functional and capable. It's, it's tough. I, I could see some doomsday scenarios, uh, both in terms of unethical behavior, on corporations, unethical behavior on governments and people. I could also see some very positive scenarios, but it's going to be uh, it's going to be an interesting, possibly bumpy ride. It's going to be yeah. an interesting ride. One final question, I think, and then we might uh, call it an evening. Uh, Cameron has asked a couple of questions about cybersecurity GRC. He said, "Is this something to get into uh, as somebody coming from networks, and what's oh. the future scope with that in AI?" Cameron, that's a fantastic question. GRC, Governance, Risk Management, and Compliance. GRC, absolutely a very viable uh, option. In fact, there are a lot of people who have gotten into cybersecurity who are slightly less technical. Some are very technical. They both can do well in GRC. Again, GRC means you can take a look at one data set that says, here's the rule that we're going to follow, ISO 27000 or you know NIST 800 or something, 800-851 some sort of standard. And then here's the data set that, <laughs> that says, here's where the company is. Are they apples and oranges? You know, is, are they comparison? Does that person, does that company get 80%, 20% score? Are they doing well? Yes. Somebody with a networking knowledge could do very well with GRC. Having said that, I've, I've seen people, uh, Julie Byerly, she did have to learn networking, but a year and a half before she got her first job as a governance, risk management, and compliance manager. She's a second grade school teacher. Now think about that. And, and she said uh, the skill set that she leveraged, right, was that she said there's a very little difference between walking into a room of second graders and walking into a room of CIOs and CEOs and CFOs. <laughs> you, you have to redirect them. They're like a little, you know, they're just kind of running around and you have to teach both of them you know, what the standards are. So I thought that was kind of a fun. Hope, hopefully less pools of water under the chairs. Slightly. It depends on what the, what you have to tell them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, there's a whole lot of crying or, or whatever and going on sometimes in those GRC meetings. Absolutely. But networking could be a great way to start. Uh, folks, a lot of these jobs that I've talked about are adjacent to each other. Adjacent meaning somebody who does networking obviously can move over into cybersecurity. Somebody who has that can move over into data analytics. Uh, they're, they're much more adjacent than we think. Yeah. Um, I think 
that's probably a good point to call it for the evening. I would like to say thank you to everybody for uh, coming along and, and listening to you, James. It has been fantastic to have you here. Um, there's a couple of things that I want to reiterate. One is that for all of our students in our postgraduate courses, there is a CompTIA discount available that they can um, they can sign up for, and Kit has posted that. Uh, for us on the uh, on the chat so feel free to ask us about that the other thing is to remind you that we will be doing a short course a free short course in about July or June probably on security plus on helping people um, work towards that certification usually the short courses don't cover everything but they mm -hmm. they get you started on that and uh, it's a good introduction to some of the other stuff we do but Again, I'd like to thank you very much for taking time out of your hectic schedule. Uh, no problem, James man. is telling us all of the capitals in the world that he's going to visit in the next few weeks, and there's quite a few. Um, and it would be remiss of me not to say a big thank you to Kit as well, who has been our um, moderator tonight and has steered everybody around. But uh, thank you once again. And um, don't forget to look up James on LinkedIn. And we look forward to seeing you at one, the next webinar or short course. Everybody, Thanks, thank you so much. Uh, again, Shane, Kit, thank you so much. It's been terrific. Uh, I hope it's useful. Let's do it again. I'm ready. We will take you up on that. You may <laughs> regret those words. <laughs> take care, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.